for today. Mostly sunny with a high near 75. West wind between 5 and 8 miles per hour. Tonight, partly cloudy with a low around 56. West northwest wind between 3 and 5 miles per hour. And then on Friday, partly sunny with a high near 73. Currently in Wausau, with fair skies, it is 47 degrees at 9.01. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Thursday edition of Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret, and we are going verse by verse today through the book of Galatians. We continue our verse by verse study through the book of Galatians. We pick up our study in chapter 2, verse 11. But first, the views and the opinions of this program are solely the views of myself. It may not be the same as that of our management group, the friends of WNRBLP, or our owners, the Wassa Area Hmong Mutual Association. And Father, I ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of Galatians. The It's only six chapters in this book, but it is, as I have said, spiritual dynamite. It deals with God's plan of salvation. The Apostle Paul started the churches in the Galatian region, and when he left, some false teachers came in and they added all sorts of things to the gospel of salvation by faith plus nothing. Faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way to get to heaven. And Paul is writing now to defend the truth of God's word. And so for that reason, it gives us a clear picture of how to get to heaven. God's plan for saving a soul. And we pick it up right where we left off in verse 11. But let's begin reading actually in verse 9. It says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, now those were the apostles in Jerusalem, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was eager to do. And now in verse 11 it says, But when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. Paul was no respecter of persons. He played, he did not play favorites for anyone. He did the right thing, period. And he would not allow himself to be intimidated by anyone, even the great apostle Peter. And so he withstood Peter to his face. In other words, he rebuked him when he was wrong. We are living in a time when no one is supposed to tell anyone that they are wrong. We are living in a time where it seems to be politically incorrect to make a value judgment about anything except maybe the truths of Christianity. It seems to be open season on the Bible and Bible-believing Christians, but that's just about it. Well, Paul was not so open-minded. He rebuked even the big guy, the Apostle Peter. And here's why. Verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them who were of, a, who were of the circumcision. Now, you've got to have some background, I guess, to really understand this. In, in the mind of first century Jewish people and Old Testament Jews, you didn't eat with Gentiles. Gentiles were considered to be dogs, without God, without hope, and you didn't eat with them. You didn't, you didn't touch them. Well, Christianity changed all that. Jesus came not only to reconcile man to God, 
but also to reconcile Jews and, and uh, Gentiles together in Christ. And Peter, who was a Jew, a Christian of course, but a Jewish Christian, he had embraced the Gentile Christians, recognizing that God had brought Jews and Gentiles together as one in Christ. But when his fellow Jewish Christians showed up at an event, well then Peter shrunk back and he acted like the Gentiles should be avoided again. See what he did? He was afraid of what his fellow Jewish Christians might think if they saw him hanging around and eating with Gentile Christians. Sometimes the first step towards sin occurs when a person is afraid of what others may think if they live God's way. That's the first big mistake. Here's the deal. If God is pleased, that's good enough. It doesn't matter what other people think. Not if you please God. 13. And the other Jews joined likewise with him, so that Barnabas also was carried away with their hypocrisy. And so these men, they were acting like a bunch of hypocrites. They knew better than to suggest that the Gentiles were somehow second-class Christians or something like that. But at, but at this particular moment that is referred to here, they obviously loved themselves more than they loved Jesus, and they loved themselves more than they loved truth, and that's why they're compromising. Doesn't mean they weren't saved. They were, but it's, it's possible for a Christian to fall into sin. It is possible for a Christian to fall into disgusting behavior. It's just not possible, according to 1 John, for a Christian to remain in disgusting behavior. Verse 14. So, look at Here comes Paul. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compel you the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? In other words, Paul said, Peter, you are Jewish. You are a Jewish Christian. But you have not lived by Jewish laws for a long time now, because you're a Christian. So why do you make the Gentile Christians feel like second-class Christians, because they're not living by Jewish laws? I'll tell you why. Peter was trying to please the legalistic Jewish Christians. That's why he was being a hypocrite. He was trying to please the legalistic Jewish Christians. And that is a lost cause. You cannot satisfy a legalistic Christian of any kind. And there are plenty of them today. You cannot satisfy a legalistic Christian because they don't know when enough legalism is enough. They are never sure of their salvation. They are miserable, and as a result, it is miserable to try to please them. And it's a lost cause. 15. He continues, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. If you know someone who thinks that they can or must work their way to heaven, by keeping the law of God, I would suggest that you give them this verse of Scripture. Galatians 3, verses 15 and 16. And if they still believe that they can get to heaven by working their way there, then I would suggest that you pray for them. Because this verse is so clear that a person has to be spiritually blind if they don't see that it is impossible for anyone to work their way to heaven. 
knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, how clean, how clear is that? But by faith, the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Pretty clear, isn't it? 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. A Christian is someone who believes in Christ and follows Christ. That's what a Christian is. Because if you really believe in Jesus, you're going to want to follow Him. And you're going to want to live for Him. Otherwise, the faith isn't real. So a Christian is someone who lets Jesus calls the shots. And believe me, Christ never leads Christians into sin. That's why anyone who habitually sins does not have Jesus Christ in them. Christ does not promote sin. First John, again, teaches that. Verse 18. He says, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If, if we, we sin, we sin if we try to get right with God by keeping the old Jewish laws of the Old Testament. We sin if we try to get right with God by keeping religious laws of any kind. Paul used to do that. But then Jesus appeared to him and showed him that's wrong. You know, some people think that if they do their religion well enough, they have a better than even shot of making it to heaven. But God's Word teaches that we have to receive Christ. We have to have a real relationship with Jesus to be saved. That's how it gets done. 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. In other words, Paul is saying, by reading the scriptures, I realized what God's holy requirements really were. And the Apostle Paul was also honest enough to admit that he didn't meet those requirements. When a person compares their life to what God demands, any hope of being saved by being good enough goes right out the window, if they are honest. 20. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Someone says, you know, it sounds like one of those evangelical sayings. Trust in God. That's another one. Give it to the Lord. That's another one. People used to always say those evangelical adages to me, and, and then they'd walk away and I would be scratching my head thinking, what in the world does that mean? Sounds good, but what does it mean? How does it work? Well, listen to what he says again. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's a whole lot there. Let me summarize it for you. Here's what he means. Jesus lives out his life and his will on earth through Christians every time Christians choose to do the correct thing instead of doing the sinful thing. Jesus lives out his life here on earth through Christians every time they choose to do the correct thing instead of the sinful thing. That's what it means. And Paul is saying that he did not choose the things that pleased his sinful nature. He chose the things that pleased Christ. And that's how Christ lived through him. And that's how Christ wants to live through every Christian. Verse 20, I am crucified, actually verse 21. He says, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words, what he is saying is this. If we could be saved by the law, 
If we could be saved by our own effort, by our own good works, then Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross for nothing. Do you see that? And if that was the case, then the Bible would say, earn your salvation by being good enough. Instead of what it does say, to as many as receive Christ, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. It is 916. Time for our break. You're listening to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. I'll be back in a few minutes. Hello. Thanks for joining us for Our Daily Bread. Your host is Les Lamborn. Creation's design points to the master designer. When the great physicist Albert Einstein was asked if he believed in God, he responded, quote, We're in the position of a little child entering a huge library filled with books in many languages. The child knows someone must have written those books. It doesn't know how. That, it seems to me, is the attitude of even the most intelligent human beings toward God. We see the universe marvelously arranged and obeying certain laws, but only dimly understand these laws. Although Einstein marveled at the design he saw in nature, he didn't believe in a personal creator. The psalmist shared Einstein's sense of awe about nature, but took it to the next step and believed in the designer behind the design. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. The wonder we feel as we behold our universe should serve as a road sign pointing to the one who created it. The scriptures tell us, All things were made through Christ, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Are you struggling in your beliefs? Look up at the stars tonight. In the sky is crafted an amazing road sign pointing to the designer behind the design. Psalm 19 verses 1 through 9 is a psalm of praise written by the psalmist David. And I'll read from Psalm 19 verses 1 through 9. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Father, thank you that you've made yourself known to us, not only a creator God, but a God who is personal and concerned for our everyday existence. Thank you for your provisions, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And as you think about today's meditation, remember, creation's design points to the master designer. We hope that what you've heard today has been helpful. To receive an introductory edition of Our Daily Bread, contact us via email at getodb at rbc.org. That's getodb at rbc.org. 
or you can go online to rbc.org, that's rbc.org, and read today's article or listen to the audio again. Our Daily Bread is furnished by RBC Ministries. And with fair skies, it's 55 degrees in Wausau at 920. Welcome back to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are studying the book of Galatians, and we left off in chapter 3. We're about to read verse 1. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. The Apostle writes, Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been plainly or been openly set forth, crucified among you. Who has bewitched you? The Judaizers, as they were known. They were false teachers who tried to add the Old Testament laws to the work of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, who has bewitched you? He's talking to the Christians who are being led astray by these false teachers. Well, they didn't bewitch them in the sense of casting a spell on the Galatians. They didn't use a magic potion. You know what they used? They used words. Satan uses people to bewitch others, as it were, with words. Words that sound good and seem to make spiritual sense. But when you really think about them, and you compare them with Scripture, you realize they have no biblical support. Those kind of words are the devil's specialties. That's why everything needs to be measured by the plain, clear teaching of God's Holy Word. And if it goes contrary to Scripture, then you reject it, because it's not of God. And then he says in verse 2, This only what I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Well, they, they did not, the Galatians did not receive the Holy Spirit after keeping X amount of God's laws for X amount of days in a row. You know, they were not on probation, as it were. And, and then God said, Okay, you've kept my law perfectly for seven days or whatever, so now I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. That's not how it worked. They received the Holy Spirit when they heard about Jesus Christ dying on the cross, paying for their sins, and when they believed the message and trusted Him to save them from hell. That's when they received the Holy Spirit. 3. The Apostle says, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? The law cannot give spiritual life to begin with, So it is nonsense to think that we are to stay saved or progress in our salvation by attempting to keep the law. We can't do any good works to get ourselves saved, to get ourselves right with God, so it only follows that we cannot do any good works to keep ourselves right with God either, or to become more like Jesus. It's all the work of the Holy Spirit, not the law. In verse 4, the writer says, Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, and it sure seemed like it. You know, I when I read this, I was thinking about actually squirrels. Squirrels are not very intelligent. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. It's happened to me many times. You know, a squirrel will run out on the street in front of you. You're driving down the street, a squirrel runs out in front of you. I have seen squirrels run 70, 80 percent of the way across the street, and then they hear a car, and instead of just going the other 30 percent, they turn around and they go back. Instead of going the short distance that they have left, they return all the way across the road doesn't make any sense. But the Galatian Christians were kind of acting like that, like squirrels. They suffered severely for Jesus Christ because of their faith in Christ. They had persevered with Jesus. They had suffered uh, persecution because they were Christians. 
they had gone a long way with Jesus, but now, because of the false teachers, it all seemed like it was a waste. Because now, they are back to where they were before they received Christ. And Paul's saying, what are you doing? You suffered all that for nothing. And it was. Was it for nothing? Well, if they returned to Judaism, or some mixture of Judaism and Christianity, yeah, it was all for nothing. All that suffering was in vain, because they're going to lose it. They're going to lose their salvation, if they haven't already. Verse 5. He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? And there's another thing. See, Paul is pointing out the superiority of faith in Jesus Christ over the law. And here he does so with regards to miracles. God did not do miracles in the early church because the Christians kept the Jewish law or the Old Testament laws or any other laws. The miracles came through the power of the Holy Spirit to authenticate the message that we are saved through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and by our faith in that work. That's what the miracles uh, came from. You know, if God's going to do a miracle, He's not going to do it because we have somehow made ourselves good enough to deserve it. Verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So he's saying, think about Abraham. Paul's saying, think about Abraham. Consider Abraham. How did God deal with Abraham? You who want to be saved by works. How did God deal with Abraham? How did Abraham get right with God? See, if you know the answer to that question, then you will know how to get right with God. A Baptist pastor once said to me, well, it was probably 20 years ago, he said, Mike, in New Testament times, people get saved by faith. But back in the Old Testament days, people got saved by works, by keeping the law. Not true. Not true at all. Verse 6, again, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Know you therefore that they who are of the faith, who are of faith, the same are children of Abraham. So another title for a child of God would be the saved. In other words, if you trust Almighty God through Jesus Christ for your salvation, like Abraham did, then you are a child of Abraham, then you are saved, and you have been saved the same way Abraham was saved way back in the Old Testament. Paul is defending salvation by faith plus nothing by faith in Jesus Christ. If you have any questions for me, comments, prayer requests, you can write me at Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasser, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. At Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasa, 54402-2211. If you would rather email me, you can do that. I can be emailed at vbyvmm at aol.com. That's vbyvmm at aol.com. If you need somebody to speak at your church or for your group, again, my address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasa, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. Or you can email me, vbyvmm at aol.com. My name is Michael Moret. The name of this program is Scripture Verse by Verse. I am with you Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. See you tomorrow morning for another edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. Until then, so long everyone. Thereof.